Uh, let's start. Good morning. How are you? I'm from California. I think it's, it's later in the day, but yesterday, tomorrow, I'm not even sure. So we'll see how it goes. I'm wide awake right now. The coffee seems to work. So I'm going to be talking to you about what's new in ASP.NET Core. Um, I feel like at Microsoft, we jump way into the new and shiny stuff, and we only talk about the stuff we shipped yesterday, and we don't even talk about the stuff we shipped two months ago or three months ago. When I talk to people face to face, I realize I think that's a mistake. I feel like we need to tell a bigger full picture. So my plan here is to talk kind of big picture, some stuff you may not know about in 2.1 or some stuff that you heard about months ago and then it went by and now you don't remember because we're throwing 2.2 stuff at you. For my reference, who here is running ASP.NET Core 2.1 like seriously in production? Awesome. Who here is not running any ASP.NET Core at all um, and is embarrassed to maybe put their hand up, but good, brave. Thank you, sirs. Thank you. Th thank you, everyone. That's, so I feel like this is, even for me, I mean, like, it's kind of my job to keep up with the newest, what we just shipped last week, what might come out next week. It's so easy to forget. So I want to tell kind of a big full picture. So we're going to start with some .NET Core general stuff that applies especially to ASP.NET Core developers. We're going to recap some of the exciting stuff in ASP.NET Core 2.1 um, from build uh, timeframe. And then we're going to be looking at ASP.NET Core 2.2. Uh, we just shipped the preview for this last week at .NET Conf. And so I'm going to be talking about that um, as well. And then at the end, I'm going to take a quick look at Blazor. Um, so who here was at the Blazor talk yesterday? Good, a lot of you. Um, and I don't have time to do an in-depth. I, I have time to do a quick look at it and kind of you know, overview it, whet your appetite if you want to learn more, that kind of thing. And I'm going to try and pack all this into an hour, so good luck. Um, first of all, ASP, or .NET Core 2.1. There's a lot of stuff in here that really impacts ASP.NET developers. So one thing is build or we'll just look at all three of these, build performance, global tools, and then some, some of the nuts and bolts that make your ASP.NET Core applications faster. So first of all, build performance. And this is not you know, a super exciting thing to say, hey, build performance, but it really does make a difference. Um, this impacts your day-to-day -day workflow. We notice that developers, you know, even file new project takes a little bit to build, but when you start building a larger application, it really imp impacts your workflow to the point that you don't build as often as you should, or you don't run your tests as often as you should, that kind of stuff. So what we looked at with this is for a, f a small ASP.NET Core, and this is just looking at 2.1. It's gotten better even since then. Um, but for a small uh, file new project, it went from si six seconds to two seconds. For a larger, more real world application, uh, this is Orchard, is our, our uh, web large core example test project. And we went from over 100 seconds to 10 seconds. So this is, this is the kind of thing where this makes a big difference in your workflow. It changes the way that you're, you, know, you, you start losing that muscle memory of like wait, wait a while to build, and you can just build all the time. Especially if you're using something like .NET Watch. Anyone use .NET Watch? Really cool. So I love that workflow. Um, I was actually shipping a website last week, and I had the whole .NET Watch run going on my, on my site. And I had Visual Studio Code for a lot of CSS tweaks and like occasionally touching the back end, but not too much. Boom, boom, boom. It's really, really fast. So this build performance makes a big difference. OK, another neat thing is global tools. So this is something where, like a lot of stuff in the ASP.NET world, you know, we sometimes look at other platforms and we go, oh, that's cool over there. We should learn what they're doing and do something like that. So other, other platforms have things like this. NPM has this great global tools ecosystem. There's other platforms out there like this, right? And so instead of requiring you to install a NuGet package into your application to do something, what about if it's global and I want to use it all across all my projects? Don't make me install that package into every single project, right? So that, that tool I just talked about, .NET Watch, that's something where instead of having to put it in each project, you install it once as a global tool. Um, so we are shipping a lot of things as global tools. And 
and we also make it easy for you to, sh to build your own global tools. So it really is just a console application with a, a few little tinkerings in your CS proj. Um, so, so the idea here, let, let me pop over to this real quick. Um, as an example, if I go, here are my global tools that I've got installed, right? So I do, uh, did not switch It always, thank you. You're like on the ball because I always, usually it's like 15 minutes later, someone's like, hey, uh, were you intending to and stop? I, it looks like this is just what we're gonna see the rest of the day. Uh, slideshow. I don't know if it's because uh, this might be an interesting thing. If I kill PowerPoint, will it like stop? Oh, I'm in presenter view. I hate presenter view. I actually am gonna kill PowerPoint. Get out of here. Do save changes. There it is. So here's, here's my global tools, right? So I did .NET tool list G. These are my global tools I've got installed. Some of these, um, there are some also that we install by default. So things like creating and trusting uh, HTTPS certs, that's something that we deliver to you via global tools. And these are other ones that I got. Um, and I can go out, uh, this is information about, you know, how global tools work on the docs. And this guy on the ASP.NET team actually has built this list of community global tools. So we're working on making this more discoverable. What we'd like to do is have a tag in NuGet and say, filter down and just show me global tools. But this is really neat. These are ones like Shane Boyer on, on the um, CDA team wrote one. It's a command line tool to search the docs. Um, there's all kinds of other ones. The Cake team built one for Cake. Um, there's, you know, this Cowsay one is an example just to kind of teach you how to write a, a basic, uh, basic one. But so this is something where it's good to know about in terms of just as you're building ASP.NET applications, you're going to be using global tools. And it's also good to know about in terms of like you can build your own. All right, let's hopefully I open the right one here. We'll pop right back into it. So that's, that's, I'm going to be talking, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, I'm going to be talking about global tools, uh, or excuse me, uh, docs quite a bit. And I do encourage you to, um, to look at the docs. The docs have gotten better and better over time. Uh, no, I've done it again. Look at me. All right, let's see if this does it. It's totally going to work now. All right, upload failed. That is not what we want to see. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll have some, maybe I'll get some surprises out of this too. Uh, okay, span of T. So span of T is an example of something. The ASP.NET team, one of their goals when they first built ASP.NET Core was to make it a lot faster. Uh, they looked at the benchmarks, uh, for just ASP.NET and the full framework, and we didn't compare very well. We were way at the bottom of the list. There's community, I'm sure you've heard about the, there's these benchmarks, Tech and Power benchmark is one we like to point to. When we first started checking, we were way at the bottom. We were terrible. And it was something where it just wasn't a, it wasn't on our list of things to check when we built ASP.NET. Uh, over time, then we said, or then we started tracking it and, and worked to move up the list. Uh, the Kestrel HTTP server, which we built so that it could be cross-platform and not only run on IIS, run all over the place, um, a part of the work we did there had all kinds of unsafe memory management, weird tricks. We would allocate blocks of memory and have pointers going into them and all these crazy things. Uh, some of the problems were you had to be a genius to work on it, and also you as a developer couldn't take advantage of those advancements. Um, and we couldn't take advantage of it really anywhere else in, in, than in Kestrel. So what we did is abstract this out, and we created some, uh, some primitives that allowed reusing all across .NET. So this is an example. Span of T allows you to point at a block of bytes and read and you know, make changes in it without allocating additional memory. So that's really it is, is to manipulate chunks of data without having to copy. 
uh, because as you know, that's one of the main performance recommendations with .NET is not to allocate memory because that kicks in the dreaded garbage collector and everything stops while garbage is being collected, right? So uh, there's this great blog post I recommend you look, look up. It's Performance Improvements in .NET Core 2.1, and this digs into how and why this actually works. What was cool was once they had this span of T, well, developers all around the world can start using it, but the .NET uh, Core CLR and Core FX could start taking advantage of it as well. So what we found, for instance, is String Builder. Well, the whole web is strings, you know? <laughs> I mean, everything you're dealing with, HTML and CSS and all these things are strings, right? So what we found was by just updating things like the String Builder, here's an example of a String Builder that is just appending uh, 100,000 times, right? And before it was allocating, you know, what, three point, uh, it was allocating and it was, and it took a while. Um, so now, by making the change, no change in the code above, just by switching to run on .NET Core 2.1, it's allocating zero memory and it's going, what, twice as fast. Here's one more example, uh, something like a string builder. Uh, you'll see two examples up above. We're calling two lower on two different strings. The first one has some uppercase and the second one doesn't. So when we needed to actually lower case, so on the, on the first example, we went, uh, what, twice as fast. And then on the second one, not only did we speed up, you know, here it's a third, as, it takes a third as long, but it allocates zero memory. So the point of all this is this stuff bubbles all the way up through the stack. Here we're just looking at things like string allocation and string builder, but the idea is, and one of my tips and one of the things I'm hoping to sell you on is, if you are running on ASP.NET Core, get to the newest versions, get to ASP.NET Core 2.1, get to ASP.NET Core 2.2 when it comes out, because by making zero changes, even if you fall asleep right now, you don't pay attention to any of the other features I show off, you're still gonna wanna take advantage of the performance improvements. Um, and so, you know, we always have to say this, I'm sure you've maybe gotten tired of us pointing at, at these uh, performance benchmarks, but it really is something we're proud of. So this is an example of a slide I hate because I have to keep updating it all the time. We, the numbers keep going up every time we run this. Um, this, this is this Tech Empower benchmark. Is, it's community run. It's not, it's not uh, done by Microsoft. There's hundreds of uh, frameworks on there from esoteric ones that are all in C++ and, you know, like kind of, are, are more academic, you'd never actually write a website in it, all the way to you know, PHP and, and Java, you know, multiple implementations of Java, et cetera. So this is, this is what we're seeing by, um, by running on this. Um, and as I showed you some of that stuff earlier with, with uh, .NET Core, the changes in .NET Core and how we handle memory, well, those, of course, have effect in ASP.NET Core 2.1. So this is an example where um, you know, even just moving again from ASP.NET Core 2.0 to 2.1, we get, we get some pretty big improvements. What we started with, and I think this makes sense, what the team started with is first focusing on just plain text response. <clears throat> get the fundamentals down. So the, the, the Tech Empower plain text has very simple specifications. Basically like with a request to this URL, return, you know, a set string, and that's it. Um, and so we, we got fast at that first. Then we started bubbling up to things like database performance um, in, in the fortunes. So the fortunes is a benchmark that includes data access um, and also JSON, JSON response, right? And so these are things where we really are starting to see some of those bigger improvements you know, in the more real world benchmarks. Okay, we're done with the .NET Core generic stuff. We're moving on to review of what shipped in ASP.NET Core 2.1. So as a reminder, ASP.NET Core 2.1, and I will watch and see if it's, so there it stopped. So I th I, my, my guess is that it just ate my slide additions from this morning, which is maybe good. Um, okay, so uh, what was I talking about? Oh, okay, so if we go to, so what is currently shipping? You can go to this dot.net site um, if you go to, like for instance, download, you'll see that the current thing is .NET Core 2.1. So what I'm gonna be showing you for, for the next kind of section of time is the currently shipping stuff. What is 
then kind of the hot sizzle new preview stuff towards the end is in this 2-2 two, two preview 2. Did we get enough twos in there to wear a 2-2? Two, two? Um, and that's over here, right? And so I'll be showing you that later. So let's talk about what we shipped in ASP.NET Core 2.1. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, I like to think of kind of conce conceptual things. There's, there's a good amount of bugs and issues and improvements in, in, in each release that are just kind of like, oh, this thing needed doing and we did it. But there are some general kind of um, focus areas that you'll see. So, you know, 1.0 was get it out the door. 1.1 is the, like everyone does, oops, you know, let's fix some stuff that we found after we shipped 1.0. Uh, 2.0 was when we updated for things like .NET Standard, and once people really started investing in it, companies and stuff like that, and, we, and started saying, here's some blockers. I would love to move to ASP.NET Core, but I can't because of this or that. So .NET Standard was a big example of that. We shipped 32,000 APIs that had been in .NET full framework, but weren't in ASP.NET Core. Uh, 2.1, which I'm showing you now, I feel like these are the kind of paper cuts of web development. Like we had a good, we, we had all the building blocks there, we had a fast web framework, um, you know, we had the APIs in place to start actually building and shipping. And these are the things that as a developer, are just extra grunt work, stuff you always have to do on a web application. So we really kind of focused on that for ASP.NET Core 2.1. And even if we didn't, that's the story I'm telling you because that's how it fits in my mind. These are the kind of, these are the kind of um, main focus areas for 2.1. And then 2.2, I'm gonna be showing you later, there's a lot of different things we ship there, but one of the kind of key focus areas there is APIs, building web APIs, right? So this I kind of see as the, um, just making things easier for you as a developer. Uh, so one thing is SignalR. So I don't know if there's a talk here on SignalR. SignalR has been around kind of for a while. It was something that was available in ASP.NET uh, for, for a while, and that is, uh, it's, a, it's a system that makes it very easy to write real-time web applications, right? So if you think of something like a chat application, and I'm chatting and you're sitting there waiting and, and you're seeing that I'm typing and then once I hit enter, it immediately shows up on your screen. That's something that can be a pain to write in a web app because you're depending on all these different browsers with different levels of support. Some, you know, some may have support for WebSockets, some may be doing long polling even, you know, uh, some, all kinds of different things. So SignalR shipped a while ago and that and it had kind of the support for a graceful fallback. So it said, I'm gonna check your browser, you know, I'm gonna see what's supported. If it doesn't support this, I'm gonna fall back to that, I'm gonna fall back to that. It keeps falling back. Um, we didn't have support for it in ASP.NET Core until 2.1. People were asking for it and it took a while to kind of restructure it and do it right. There were some, some pretty good lessons learned. Here's some stuff we wish we'd known when we built ASP.NET or built SignalR the first time. Um, so, so some of the things that are neat here is uh, it doesn't re rely on jQuery anymore. The previous version uh, did. So there's a JavaScript and a TypeScript client. There's some other kind of modern things, uh, support for message pack, et cetera. Um, there's, there is also support for simplified scale out. But one thing we found here when we talked to customers that are building large implementations with SignalR is that scaling SignalR and having this kind of multiple, many people talking to many backends and they're relaying messages back and forth and all that, it's actually kind of hard to set up. So we also shipped ASP.NET SignalR service, or excuse me, Azure SignalR service. So this is a hosted backend um, and it makes it very easy for you to kind of just toggle over in your application so you can build a SignalR app and then you can say, all right, I've got something that works on my machine, now let's actually make something that works for a lot of people, and you flip, flip some code in your application to point at the back end. Um, uh, so yeah, it's this line right here, uh, services, add SignalR, add Azure SignalR, right? So that's pretty cool. Is anyone using that, Azure SignalR? It's pretty neat. Um, okay, uh, next thing. Again, we're working through that big list of all these things. I don't expect you to memorize it. I haven't got it memorized. I am trying to, I, I guess my main point on 2.1 is it does make your life easier. If you're not on 2.1, think about it for these reasons. If you are on 
and you're not using these features, jump on them. Um, it's very easy. I've had applications where I built in 1.1 or 2.0, and I've updated, 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 and I haven't started turning on these features, so it's good to know about. So one neat thing here is identity UI and scaffolding. Um, so how often have you done file new project? Oh, I don't need identity. Let's not worry about that. A month later, your boss says, hey, so how do we log into this site? Or you think, oh, I'm going to need to an admin section or whatever it is, right? So then you've got a problem because the only way to add in that identity stuff into your application is file new project and copy a bunch of stuff in and change the namespaces and get it all. How, who here has done that before? Come on, yeah, it's not fun. Or, and, and so you always then end up like, just in case I might need identity, let's add it to every single project. And that's a pain and you're dealing with database migrations and stuff you may never even need. So what we did here is we made it so that you can um, very easily add in identity later. Um, but that's not all. We also made it so that, here, let's, let's actually pop over, I think, yeah, well, we'll do that in a second. We also made it so it's easy to customize and override the views without like having to decide. So I always worried about before, there's all these views on disk, but then I'm like, well, if I, change them, and then is something going to break them in the future? Am I really supposed to? Plus, there's tons of files on disk. When you add identity to a project, this is what it looked like in the past. Do I have laser power? I do have laser power. So this is what we actually dumped on your disk in the past. That's a lot of files. Do I need them? Do I need to track them in source control? I can't delete them. Can I change them? I don't know. It's a bunch of junk, right? And so what we do now with 2.1 and later is we just put this little thing here, and this view, st view start actually has like one line of code. And that one line of code actually says, go over to this NuGet package, because all the files are in there. If you want to change them, you can. you can. You can say, I would like to make a custom login page only, and we make it very easy to do that. So the idea here is it's something where you can add in identity later, and you can also change it and override it, and everything's wonderful. So let's do, all right, so we're going to do a new project. We're going to create an ASP.NET. We'll go to one. Yep, let's go web app. Let's do no authentication. We're being brave. So then, after I've, I've been coding away, coding away, and then now I say, oh shoot, I actually did want authentication in there. So I can do right click, add, new item, new scaffolded item. And here I've got this new thing on the list. Who here knew about that? Who here has actually used this before? All right, I'm teaching somebody something. So you go in here and you say add identity. Now, I love this, actually. I think this is really cool, because I can go in, I can point it at a different layout. I can say, I, would only, I want to only include login and logout pages, right? And then I can go through, and I'm going to have to create a data context class, and you know, I'll have to do a little bit of stuff. I'll create a user class. Great. And then I say, OK, let's do that. So let's do login and logout, OK? So I go through and do that, and it's going to scaffold this out. It's going to set it up for me, and it's only going to include those views that I told it to. Now later, if I say, oh, I didn't really want to change my logout page, I just delete the file, and it falls back to the one that's in the NuGet package. And if I do want to include a new one, I just right click on it and say, add that one in. So later, like, so here's, here's my, I've got an areas now that has identity. It's all in one nice little place. And I've got just those, uh, those ones that I told it, log in and log out. So later, if I want to rescaffold and add or remove others, I can. So I think that's cool. Now, part of the way that we did that, I've been telling you, like, hey, we did this all using a NuGet package. And that's neat. Uh, we also made it easy for you to take advantage of that, too. So we talk to people regularly that build things like, um, say, for instance, a store. And 
you need to be able to build in an admin system. So I want to ship you my cool store NuGet package, and I want to make it easy for you to go in and admin, add and remove stuff from the store, and you know, change the prices and all that kind of stuff. Well, in the past, that's been difficult to do. It's not easy to ship views in a NuGet package. So now, this is all you have to do, this Razor class library. So this Razor class library is a very, very simple, it, it compiles to a NuGet package, and you, you get a folder full of Razor pages. So you throw in your Razor pages, ship your NuGet package, I install your NuGet package, and it's good to go. And it has that whole thing in there still for, uh, I can override any file by putting one into my project with the same name and delete it and it falls back to the original. Cool stuff? All right, let's see what's going on there. Okay. All right, there's our Razor class libraries, good to go. All right, security and privacy. So these days, browsers are really pushing you hard to HTTPS. HTTPS is, is a great feature because it ensures that you are talking directly to someone else without tampering in between, right? So it, it, it allows you, now you still need to make sure that you're trusting the right person, um, but this does make it easier for you to ensure that you, you're not having people in between tampering, over, overhearing, whatever. Um, so it's a good developer practice from the beginning right from file new project to be developing with HTTPS. It's painful to develop something and then right as you're about to go live or even after you've gone live, say, oh shoot, now I have to turn on HTTPS and now a bunch of your, maybe your image links don't work or your CSS references or whatever, right? We've done that, it's a pain. So what the team did here is make it easy from, right from file new project, projects are set up with a lot of features to just get you started with HTTPS. There's a few things. There's a global tool that installs a developer cert. So this is a local testing cert, and it's just built in for you. So Visual Studio, that project I just built, that had HTTPS already turned on. I didn't have to do anything. So that cert is locally trusted. Um, we also have support in there for HTTPS redirection. So we actually, support an HTTP endpoint and an HTTPS endpoint, and by default, it'll automatically, if you go to the HTTP endpoint, no problem, we redirect you to HTTPS. So that's cool. And again, that's just middleware that's turned on by default. Um, and then there's also support for HTTP, HSTS and SNI. So again, just things that are gonna make it easier for you to develop from the start with HTTP. Um, it's, I love the way that it's been implemented. It's, I feel like it's something where it doesn't get in my way. Usually in the past, if I didn't use HTTP or HTTPS at the beginning of my project, it was because I was just like, ah, I don't have time for that now. And this is great, it's just set up by default. So also with GDPR and just general privacy, um, you know, wanting to do the right thing for your customer's privacy anyways, there's a lot of stuff that's built in for you. And again, this helps you with um, complying with regulations and also just trust for your users. So there are support for things like cookie consent. And the cookie consent is not just a banner that says click, I accept cookies. It actually has things in there that will not write cookies to, your, you know, to the browser unless the user has clicked on accept. And there's also support in there. It's a pretty rich API. There's support in there for things like uh, this cookie is required for essential, you know, it's essential for site operation, and so then it can still be written. Um, there's, uh, there's all kinds of handling with that. One other thing in there is support for identity data. So again, there's, there's more to GDPR than just requirement for clicking on a banner. There's also um, things like uh, nope, it's this one here. Let's do this. Oh dear. I think maybe it's in here. If not, I'll have to recreate the application. Um, there's also support in there for uh, tracking user personalization data and being able to, to there's this right to be forgotten and so the idea here is that I can go in and I can say, 
um, not SQL Server Object Explorer, that I can go in and, and say, you know, delete me and all my data, and it goes away. Right. It's not there, no worries. Do, do, do. Okay. So I, this is actually basically a file new project, but I did add in, oh, I called it security in GDPR. So I did, every time I show this off, I realize that I have to create a new user with a login, and then I have to apply migrations and all that stuff just to show login. And so I have saved you that minute of watching me try and type. Um, no. Uh, to log in a password and mistype that password several times. So there's really nothing on this site other than I've created a user. Like that is seriously it. So let's go to me. Hopefully I'm logged in. Cool. So this is me. Now if I click on me, I can see here I've got things like I've got personal data. I can download my data and I can delete my data. So this again, if you're using the ASP.NET identity system and you're adding additional things, if you're overriding your application user and adding additional things on there, then those things as well are tracked and deleted. So if I go in and I download my data to see what's there, it's just a simple JSON file. And so this is me. It's got my GUID, it's got my email, it's got my phone number, there we go, right? So, um, so that's that, and then I can say, nope, I don't like that, and I can delete myself, and that data gets removed. So that's built in, it's just there for you. And this is that, this is that local H, uh, HTTPS cert, and the way that's configured here is in this startup. So there's a few settings for it, but as far, like there's my HTTP, HSTS, and there's a use HTTPS redirection. And then there's also there's settings as well for um, which are my two endpoints, right? So I've got a, um, uh, it's actually in properties, launch settings, right? So I've got my SSL port and stuff. So this makes it really easy to develop right from the start uh, with things like security, privacy, and all that, and kind of starts you off in the right direction. Cool, all right, shift F5. Cool, there's that. All right, so I'm gonna have to talk faster and skip maybe a few demos because there's so much good stuff. MVC functional testing, um, the, the idea here is MVC from the beginning was built so that you could write unit tests easily. Um, but there's more to tests than just, you know, when I call my controller, does it return something containing this string? You also wanna write tests that, that are verifying the functionality of your application. Um, and so, so these, um, this, was, this was a feature where we built so that you can actually test that out. Uh, makes it a lot easier to run tests completely in memory so that you are not just unit testing a function, you're unit testing functionality, but you don't have to spin up the entire site to test it and you know, use Selenium or whatever to, to bang off it. Um, I think I do have something, let's see if I have one. Ready, if I don't, I will just move right on because demos about unit tests are super boring. Okay, I mean, I'm just saying. Um, nope, here, let's go over here. Let me see. All right, just trust me, it's super cool. You'll love it. It's the best thing ever, unit testing. All right, um, cool. API controller and action result of T. So, um, so some of the main stuff here is there's a lot of stuff in building an API that to do it right um, requires following a bunch of rules, returning the right things, telling endpoints what type, uh, what types you're returning, that kind of stuff. So, it is important to get that right to to um, build you know build something that's useful to your clients. However, it can be pretty repetitive. So this is something that started in 2.1 and continued more in 2.2. 2. 
Um, so with 2.1, there's support for this API controller, and you can drop it right on the entire controller, and it does smart things like attribute routes only and stuff like that, and figures out, um, you know, like for instance, infer from body for complex types. So stuff that you should have been putting in all your API controller methods, all those attributes, this is gonna kind of figure that out for you. Also, there's support for action result of T. So this is a generic action result. So what's neat, I do think I have one of these already going. Nope, okay, no worries. Um, see, I have two different things open. I have some of these in the preview and some not. Okay, this is totally gonna work. Nope, okay, no worries. So if I, if I create, a, um, if I create an API, pointed at a type and scaffold it, actually I may have it already open in this one. Here I've got an API, I've got it scaffolded, and it's, it's going to have a type for my get method. Nope, it doesn't, this one doesn't. Um, okay, let's do it. So. So we'll create an API, we'll point it at a simple model, and then we'll scaffold it out. So we'll do it with this one. So what this allow, allow you to do is your API will, t will tell endpoints, and if you're doing things like generating swagger and stuff like that, they can say, oh, okay, this doesn't just return some weird anonymous type, it actually returns, say, in this case, we'll do a person, right? So I'll do a person. And our person's gonna have an ID and a name. Cool, so now when we scaffold this out, let's scaffold out and add a controller. Cool, so we'll do that. So this is an example of something where you don't have to do anything different. You just, um, you know, by the act of scaffolding it out, we now are doing this, uh, telling, telling the end result what kind of type we've got. And this is built using the kind of stuff under the hood that does action result of T, right? So here we go. So this is returning an I enumerable of person, and this, this is you know, not just a change in the scaffolding, but the actual API controller infrastructure to be able to handle that. So, cool. And I was, yeah, I was doing that, good. Okay, HTTP client factory, this is really cool. So the idea here is if you've got code in your web application that's calling over to another API, getting data from someone else. As an example, on the .NET Conf site, we do this thing where we have a bunch of local events going on all around the world. We have all these local events. And we had this whole long convoluted process to get them in there, and now we actually have a thing where people enter these in a survey monkey thing, and then we go in, process them, make sure they're on our list, and then we map them. So just in this page, I'm calling the survey monkey API, and I'm calling Bing to geolocate them, right? So, in order to do things right with an API, you end up writing a lot of repetitive code, uh, or excuse me, an HTTP client. You're having to say, uh, you know, here's the endpoint for all these calls, and if something goes wrong, here's how to handle it. For GitHub, you have to include some special headers, or they won't um, listen to you. Um, so, you know, and then there's all kinds of like smarter things about fallback and that kind of stuff. Um, so, we actually made it so you can centralize things in one place. So, as an example. Um, who here was at our workshop earlier this week? Anybody? No? Only Glenn. Um, so in this, we had a um, multi-tier application where we had a client. Um, multiple people were calling into these controllers. And so we actually built an API client. So we have an IAPI client. We, we say, here's the different things it can support. And then we have these implementations Right, so these are all the, the different kind of specific methods. Go get a list of sessions and attendees and stuff. 
What's cool with this now is I can go into my startup and I can register it in one place. So I can say, add HTTP client. It's just plugged into the dependency injection. So inst instead of this, I could say, I GitHub client and GitHub client you know, implementation, whatever it is. So here, in one place, I set my base address. Well, this is great, because now I don't have to track that configuration setting all around my application. I do it in one place. And then in any of my pages that are calling into it, I just inject that API client. So I can go here, here I've injected that API client, and then I can just make calls to it. So there's a lot more to it, um, but, but that's kind of an example of how you can standardize and put it all in one place. All right, we updated our ASP.NET Core Spa templates. Um, I'm gonna move right on to the 2.2 preview. So, 2.2 preview, we just announced it last week. Uh, preview 2 was just announced at, at uh, .NET Conf last week. So I showed you before, if you go to dot.net, there's a thing up at the top, there's a little banner that says install it. In order to install it, you'll need the latest uh, Visual Studio preview, which you can go to visualstudio.com slash preview. All this stuff runs side by side. So I've got them on my laptop. I've got you know, the current Visual Studio and the Visual Studio preview. I've got multiple SDKs on there. They all are built to run side by side. So not scary, totally do it. It's cool. Um, OK, wow, that was a transition. So let's look at what's in here. First of all, we updated our template some more. So um, you know, the web moves fast. We have to keep up. So we have Bootstrap 4 and Angular 6. So if I go in here, if I do, let's close this guy. Let's do, this is my, so here I was starting to do this in the wrong Visual Studio. Let's go into this one. So this is Visual Studio Preview. You can see that little purple preview. If I go in here and create a new web application. And so there's kind of two big things that I see about this feature. One is that we're, it's running on all the latest libraries. Two is that it's also simplified quite a bit. So what we notice is our, our File new project templates tend to grow over time. Ours had the kind of jumbotron with the stuff moving around and the bulleted lists that nobody ever reads. And so instead of making you go in and delete a bunch of stuff, these are actually built pretty lightweight. So here's what the index page looks like now. It's just like welcome, right? Pretty low key. Um, so <laughs> that's about as minimal as you can get. Um, so you'll see in here, you know, we've got support for. Um, Bootstrap 4, we've got, um, and then if you do the, the new Angular ones, you've, you get that as well. Um, so this is, this is very lightweight. Here we go into this. I think it's on 413. Yep, there it is. So that's cool. All right. Um, some other stuff we'll look at. APIs. Let's, let's spend a little time looking at APIs. So APIs are all over the place. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, this is a feature or a focus area for 2.2 is making building good APIs easier. Um, Glenn showed you some of the demos yesterday if you went to his session. I'm, I'm going to look at a few more, but some of the ideas here um, as far as making things easier. So creating, make it easier to do API scaffolding that, that works well and points you in the right direction. Uh, testing and debugging. So we've got an HTTP REPL. So instead of always having to go out and, and you know, get Postman or, or Fiddler or whatever, if you just want to inspect either your API or any API on the web, this makes it easier to do. As far as documenting, there is a, uh, there's an analyzer that makes it easier to uh, that makes it easier to identify things you could attribute better in your application. But even better, we have conventions that lay on top of that. So by adding these conventions on, it'll automatically return um, useful things to your end clients without you having, you having to go in and, and make those changes. Um, yeah, so those are, and then we'll also show health checks in HTTP2 in a second here. So let's talk about web API improvements. Um, so I don't, 
Yeah, that's it. All right, so let's look at a couple things. We are going to go into, um, I'm going to create a new one. All right, so if I go in here, we'll create a new API. So I'm in, I've set ASP.NET Core 2.2 up there. We'll create an API. We will create a new model. I was gonna do a thing with venomous animals, but there's really a lot to the, the problem space. You have to really think that through. Um, oops. And we give it age. Okay, cool. That's neat, okay. So cool, so now we're going to generate a, we're going to create a new controller. Cool, we'll do API, I guess we'll use any framework. That may make me skip over some of this. Because okay. I'm gonna have to do um, migrations and stuff. What I wanna show you is really just two things. I wanna show, first of all, putting that analyzer on here. Um, so there's an analyzer, and I have one here that's completed, um, which is this line here. So you add, there's a line that you add into your CS proj to turn on this analyzer. So now, if before doing this, if I just do a build, it's all like, yeah, you built the world's best API. So now let's go in, let's edit our CS proj, and we're gonna add in this analyzer. And now we'll build it. And it should tell me. It's like, uh oh. Okay, so here's some things that I could do better. This is because of that analyzer. So, for instance, it's saying here I should return a 201, right? Um, so, for a post method, I should be returning a 201. And there's things in here where it can, it can go in and it can correct them or I can suppress them if needed, right? So, here I can go control dot add produces type, and now I'm good there, right? And so for kind of all of these, this not found, I really should be returning instead this. So this analyzer will go in and it'll look at all my, my returns and stuff and say, wow, you know, you're, you're, you're not writing good APIs, you're a bad person, and you really need all these attributes, right? But what's even better is I could instead use conventions to handle this. So here's an example of, so this one, by dropping this line in here, so I'm turning on these conventions, and now I still have pretty, not super attributed, you know, looking thing. I don't have to put all those on. But, and this has that same analyzer put on, but it's gonna be happy with me, and it's not gonna tell me I'm a bad person, because I've, by convention, got all those attributes applied. So, cool. So one other thing I want to show you here is this REPL. So this is .NET HTTP REPL. So this is a global tool. I spelled it wrong, huh? Thank you. Cool. So this is a global tool. I mentioned before about global tools, and you can look this one up. This is out on NuGet, right there. So it's .NET tool install dash dash global .NET HTTP REPL. So that's all that's required there. So then I can do things like set base uh, HTTPS. Uh, so I could do like api.github.com. Right, so now it's pointing at GitHub and now I can just do a get and this is gonna go and tell me all the different things. And I can go through and explore them. Or I could go in and I could point at my own API and do the same thing, 
right? And so I can explore my API and test it from command line. So this really helps me with my workflow. I'm building an API on my machine, and then I'm able to kind of inspect it and say, well, you know, what is that returning? So there's, there's a couple other things that we're adding into the, the project templates um, to make it easier for you to interoperate. And so some of these are by creating Swagger documentation. So uh, Swagger documentation basically allows someone else to pin your API, request the Swagger JSON doc, and, and that will say, here's all the endpoints, here's what you, know, here's what you can expect from this, um, and you know, here's, here's what everything returns, et cetera. And um, so, so there are two, uh, two NuGet packages that enable this, make this easy to do. So there's a Swashbuckle, and there is, I'm pointing at the wrong one. Okay. So Swashbuckle makes it easy. You add the Swashbuckle package to your project, and then it makes it easy to inspect the API. So this is an HTML-based thing. I can say, give me a list of, you know, in this case, pets that are on there. I could actually go in and create one. So I can you know, click on this and do try it out and create one and, and fill in the blanks and add it. Um, so this, this really does make it nice. John, I wonder if I can be self-referential and I am my own pet person. I'm going to break it, aren't I? Okay. Cool. I think I might have created myself twice, which is fun. Cloning. Cool. So, yeah, I got some error, probably because I created myself twice. Um, but so, Swashbuckle is this pa package that makes it easy to add in. Then there's also support for NSWAG, and NSWAG is a cool package that actually builds um, client code. So this makes it easy for you to build out a client. Um, so we've actually got that enabled in this project, and we've got that using, if we look at CS Proj here, so there's a build task in here using this project. Nope, we don't have that installed. Um, so that's this project called NSWAG. That might be in this. If not, you'll just have to trust me, but it's a cool, um, it's a cool system for allowing, like once we've got it in one place, and no, I don't have it installed. Um, I don't have time for it anyhow. But so the idea here is to make it easier to both produce documentation about my application and then uh, using this NSWAG project to go in and say, based on that documentation, build me a client. So build me either C sharp code or build me a TypeScript client or that kind of thing. So this is definitely, this is something that's, that's being developed for ASP.NET Core 2.2 as kind of a main focus area. All right, two other things to squeeze into six minutes here. HTTP 2. So this is something that's being built in by default. HTTP 2 requires HTTPS. Now that we, we have HTTPS kind of already turned on and set up for you, uh, this is just automatically going to run for you. So this is something where you don't have to make a change. It just automatically will take advantage of that. Um, and then in-process hosting. So long ago, the way that ASP, or you know, the, the way traditional ASP.NET applications worked on the full framework with IIS is as a, you know, as a module built in IIS, like you basically, your application ran inside of the process of IIS. Then later, when we built out Kestrel, and it had to run on any machine, could be an Nginx, could be in Docker, whatever, so the hosting model is, it's a separate, um, separate EXE, it's a separate, uh, you know, .NET ho or Kestrel host, and then you would call into it. So IIS actually had a very lightweight ASP.NET Core module that called in, and so they're separate pro processes. So that causes some, um, some delay because there's, there's more communication, et cetera. Plus, maybe a bigger problem is if something went wrong, it was difficult to troubleshoot. It's hard to find out what was going on. Um, and so now there's actually support for ASP.NET Core module running inside the IIS worker process. And so here's an example of you know, the performance benefit just of, of doing that. So you'll see, I believe I have that in here. If we look at my CS Proj. 
this is what's required to turn that on. It's just this ASP.NET Core hosting model. So this is, if you do file new project, that's gonna be set up for you. If you have an existing project that you migrate, this is something you'll wanna look at toggling if you're running inside of IAS. So, cool. All right, I wanna take a very quick look at, oh, well, so there's also health checks. Um, health checks, do I have already open? Health checks are super easy to turn on. Um, so the idea here with health checks, it's already included in the meta package. Um, so you just, there's the use health checks to, to tell it what the endpoint is. And then you can say add health checks for a very basic, or you can do something like, um, here's an example where I've got adding a check for a database connection. So here I've got a, something to check if I'm able to connect to my database. What's nice with this is I can say um, my application is only healthy if I can get to the database, and I can figure it so that if, if, for instance, one instance of my application is not reachable, here's an example where Azure realizes that and fails over. All right, I'm going to take the very quickest look at Blazor, and then we're gonna move on to your next session. Um, so, so, uh, so here's, Here's kind of the big picture. We just shipped Preview 2 and RTW by end of the year. Cool. So the idea with Blazor is basically, um, I'll just give you the elevator pitch for it. If you want to build an application with, if you are mostly a .NET developer and you're, you know, you are, um, you're comfortable with building with Razor and C Sharp, you would like to have you know, write front end a front end application. You would write, like to write something that runs in the browser that is mostly front end client, and you don't want to spend a bunch of time. It's not your core skill set to build out, you know, an Angular build chain or that kind of stuff. Um, so, if you go to Blazor.net, you can learn about this. Um, the idea is here is that you are writing an application where your front end code is written in C Sharp and .NET. So I have. Two quick examples of that. One is if I go to File New. Nope. Okay, so here, because I've installed the Blazor tools and I'm in the wrong project, let's go over here. So I'm going to show you a quick look at File New with Blazor, and then I'll show you an example of one that I built recently. Um, so here, uh, you install the, the stuff for Blazor by going to blazor.net and it points you at a v6 package. Um, so here I've got that installed, and so I'm going to create a new Blazor application. And the thing you'll see here is that it looks, if you just glanced at it, you'd say, oh yeah, there's just Razor pages and C Sharp. It's very, very kind of simple. Um, so here's an example of a page. Um, here I'm doing things like I've got a counter, and when I click on a button, it increments the number. Uh, excuse me, that's this one here. Right, so I just have button click code and it updates. Um, but the cool thing is, there's, there's a few cool things here. Uh, one is, this is all running in the browser using web standard technologies. It is, um, it's compiled C-sharp code, so I'm testing, I'm getting any kind of C-sharp you know, build and, and type checking and all that. Um, I'm getting native co compiled speed performance. I'm able to use NuGet packages, and I'm able to take advantage of um, shared libraries. So if I've got a class library on the server, you know, maybe that's my, um, you know, my person class or whatever it is, I can also use that down on the client. So here's an example. We built out this, this conference planner application, which is like a website planning application, and I built out a front end for it using Blazor the other day. And the idea here is I've got, um, here's a very simple example. I showed you that API client before. Um, here's an example that's calling into that API client. So I'm just calling get JSON async. This is standard C sharp code with IntelliSense and debugging and all that. And, um, and so it's able to you know, take advantage of, of all that kind of C sharp development knowledge that I've got. And um, you know, I don't have to, try and move into a different problem space. So of course we still, we have support for those templates for, for Angular, et cetera, templates. We still you know, 
continue to love and support all those things. But we do think this is kind of an interesting um, idea if you are if you're a C sharp developer and you want to build front end stuff. Um, so. Uh, if you are interested, you need to let us know. This is something where Microsoft is still figuring out if it's a committed product or not. Um, so if you can go to blazor.net um, and install this, and then at the end of it, once you run File New Project, there's a little thing that says uh, a survey. Let us know, and then we can say, OK, bosses, let us ship this. So here's an example where I've gone in and I've built this conference application. It's um, hitting this backend API, and what's neat is that this is all done uh, client-side now. So I can filter, I can do all this stuff, I can do C-sharp link queries, et cetera, and that's all handled on the client. Okay, we packed a ton of stuff in. Um, my main goal, again, was to kind of survey and overview what's, what's new and exciting in ASP.NET Core. Um, if you are interested, you can go to, again, for Blazor, go to blazor.net. Otherwise, go to dot.net and, um, and also to the ASP.NET weblog. And there's, there's, uh, they've been doing really good feature overview posts lately on all this stuff. So I'll be here through the end of the day tomorrow. Happy to take your questions now or, or later through the week. So thanks so much.